Hello and welcome to our webinar this week. So this week our topic is, I'm not a cat, what to do when online lessons go wrong. So when you are new to online teaching, there's a whole plethora of things that we need to learn so that we can make sure that our lessons run smoothly. Because unfortunately things go wrong in lessons not just online, but they also go wrong in real life classrooms. But online, there's a few more things that we need to be aware and prepared for. So in our webinar today, we're going to look at the following things. We're going to look at troubleshooting when teaching online classes, having a plan B when plan A fails, because it does happen, the art of winging it when that's appropriate and when it's not appropriate to do that, the importance of preparing and being prepared, something we have mentioned a lot in our webinars. Uh, just to remember when things do go wrong, because unfortunately they will at some point. And finally, our section at the end for questions and answers for anybody who has any questions. So as always, um, Rose is my co-host today and she'll be happy to ask, uh, answer those questions and ask me them as we go through today. So let's begin. So this is a very well-known quote by Benjamin Franklin, which is incredibly true. So by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. So without preparation, we're going to make mistakes. We're not going to know how to deal with difficulties that happen. So we, we, fail, we prepare to succeed, but when we prepare, we also need to prepare for things that could go wrong so that we always succeed and we don't fail. The first piece of advice, which is probably pretty straightforward, but is vital, is to keep calm and breathe. If we panic, then the lesson could very quickly become a disaster. If we take stock, step back and just think, OK, what's going on? How can I deal with this? Which we'll talk about in more detail. We can begin to be in control of the situation. Panicking only ever leads to more and more problems. Students will pick up on it. You will become incredibly uncomfortable and very quickly the lesson could, be, could go downhill and could be much more difficult to bring it back and have a successful lesson. So we're going to look at five common issues that we come across when teaching online. So our first one, time zones. This may seem a bit of an odd one, but if you become a, an online teacher, particularly for ESL, and you are not in the country that you are teaching the children or the students who are, are from, you will very likely be in a different time zone. For instance, the students that I teach, when I'm teaching, it's the morning for me, but for them, it's the late afternoon or evening. Some people will find they are teaching in the middle of the night, their time, and for their students, it's the middle of the day. So we need to be aware of those time zones, because if we're not and we're half asleep or we're not sure what time it is, we could get we could miss our lessons or we couldn't be awake and prepared for them. So how do we deal with this? Well, here's some really easy solutions. Change sleeping habits. So if you know you need to be up in the middle of the night regularly for your students, change your sleeping habits so that you have a pattern so that you are sleeping maybe when they would be. Why would we do this? So that we don't miss alarms, so that we're not too sleepy and we're awake and alert for all of our lessons at any of those times. Make sure you are prepared and ready. So preparing for a lesson maybe the night before or definitely a few hours before will ensure that you have checked the time of your lesson in both time zone, your time zone and the student's time zone. You aren't rushing to get things ready and if you are doing a lesson at an unusual time, it'd be much harder to be prepared and ready at the last minute because if you're tired or you're not, not used to a new sleeping habit, then that could result in you being unprepared for your lesson. And the last two really go hand in hand. So take into account the time zone of your students and then use this to be able to ask appropriate questions. What do we mean by this? Well, it's no good asking your students what they're having for lunch if they're about to go to bed after your lesson or saying to them, what will you do at school today when they've already been to school? So simple things like that, keeping that in mind can help you know your students, 
you know the time zone and you can ask appropriate questions such as, did you have a good day at school today? What did you eat for lunch today? And so forth. So Rose, do you have any more things that you would like to add to that from your own experience? Yes, um, I think knowing the time zone of your student is extremely important, like you said. Um, majority of the time we are working with younger students and learning a second language it's already confusing for them mm -hmm. so asking questions that you know they won't understand you know or they might think well I've already been to school or I've already had lunch uh, it can just add to confusion and it can just kind of you know set a a awkward tone in the lesson so I think it's extremely important that you know, you know, which country your student is from uh, to be able to, like you said, ask appropriate questions, make the lesson easier to follow along, you know, don't ask questions that they will not be able to answer. Yes, definitely. And a good tip, if you're not sure what time it is because that can happen I struggle with that sometimes thinking is it eight o'clock yet or is it still five o'clock you can ask your student even if they're a young student and they haven't got much vocabulary they can tell you if it's morning they can even show you sometimes I've had students do that I say what time is it or is it the morning or is it the night time or for an older or more able student you can say what time is it and they can say oh it's half past four that way you can double check yourself and think, okay, this I have got it right. Oh, oops, no, let's not ask them about the letter, ask them about this. So the second common problem, and this probably is the one that happens the most, technological issues. So computers are our friends, but they're also our enemies at times. We have all been let down by technology, be that our power dropping out, our internet suddenly stopping, or our equipment, which we thought was great, suddenly failing at the last minute and particularly with online those are huge issues what do we do how do we prepare for these sorts of problems so here's some solutions have a backup power or internet source so you can also invest in a battery pack or a ups so when i began uh, doing online teaching this is something i had to invest in they're not overly expensive and it just means i know that if my power fails, then I've got a source that I can just uh, plug my laptop and my internet in and that's it, I'm good, I'm good to go. So this can be a problem. I know uh, in, in certain countries they may have, or certain areas may have real difficulties with this being a frequent problem. If this is the case where you are, then really ensure you invest in a really decent battery pack or a UPS to make sure you've got that power source in case it drops out. Become familiar with using your phone as a hotspot. So many of us are used to using ours or our friends' phones Wi-Fi hotspots when we're with each other. So for example, maybe I haven't got enough data, I'll use my friends to share things or look things up on the internet. Well, we can use that if our internet suddenly fails at home or wherever we may be. We need to ensure that we have good enough data and according to your company, the right speeds, and if you're freelancing, make sure you know what speed you need to ensure that you can still conduct your lesson, but be able to use it at a second's notice. It would be awful if your internet dropped and you know you can do it, but you haven't practiced, you don't know how to do it. So become familiar with it. And invest in good and reliable equipment. So becoming an online teacher, it could be a career, it could be a way to fund your traveling, or it could be a bit of pocket money. Either way, we're still providing a service to our students. They're still paying us for this. So we have a responsibility to ensure that our equipment is not only good, but it's reliable. So for me, when I began, I invested in a decent, in a decent laptop because my other one would never have lived up to the standards that I needed. So it's worth that investment. Number three, classroom management. So. If you have a one-on-one -on -one lesson, which many uh, online lessons are, it's much easier to control that student's behavior than if you have a big group. And more and more online classes now are catering for group sessions. So this can mean it's noisier. There are some students that are behaving very well and some students that aren't behaving so well. 
maybe you're struggling to hear them, different things like this. Rose, what other problems do you think we could come across in a classroom, either on a one-to-one -one or in a group setting? Yes, yeah, so I think in a group setting, majority of the time, the issues that we would experience would be behavior. You know, um, it's very difficult to control a group of children when you're not physically with them. Yes. So yes. Um, I think that could be a big factor to that. And then possibly in a one-to-one, -one, you know, maybe the, it's very overwhelming for the student. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they shy away from the lesson. So all those um, issues could definitely affect your lesson and cause you to have to either adapt or yeah. like we will talk about later, wing it in some yeah. stages. Yeah, definitely. I agree with all, all of that. It's all very true. Here's some simple solutions. that can have gestures and actions which can help direct the flow of the classroom. What do we mean? So with online, particularly with ESL, having really good gestures or TPR and that they're, they're consistent. So you have the same gesture and you use it frequently. That will help your students to understand what you're asking them to do. Are you asking your students to read? Are you asking them to listen, to find something? Having gestures like this, your students are guided. They know what you're asking them to do. It reduces your talk time as well. And it can control and keep that calm because you're not having to give lots of instructions. It's simple. And you can also use those for your what, you know, your what words and, and other things if you're asking questions. So that's really important. In a group lesson, you can ask students to come up with a way to signal to you when they've got a question or answer. So it could be that you ask them to physically raise their hand. It could be that you ask them to give you some kind of fun signal. Maybe you have an online classroom which has a tool to raise a hand or some other, some other forms that you can know. This way, your students know that they can engage with you, but they have to do it in a certain way. And to do signals, they can't be overly noisy. But it also means that if there are a noisy group of people, you can easily spot which ones who are maybe waving madly or doing their funny sign want to answer the question or want to pose a question. And use phrases such as, it's your turn to speak. This works particularly well when you know the names of your students. For example, Lucy, it's, it's your turn to speak. So this could engage somebody who's a little bit reluctant. We'd never want to put them on the spot, but if we know that they, they want to, but they're a bit unsure, saying something like this means they know they have that control for that time and that, that you trust them. So you're controlling that management, you're encouraging them. This also is a great way when you've got a very noisy group of students and you can simply say, OK, it's Lucy's turn to speak now. And you wait for the class, rest of the classroom to be silent until Lucy speaks. OK, so another way to keep it to keep it quiet that I find very useful is when you have a group that's very noisy and you tried these things and they're still not responding to you. Sometimes simply just sitting there and waiting works wonders you may think it's not but yeah, and, a, and a second can feel like a lifetime in that situation but it works really well because very rarely when you have a, a group of students who are all too noisy who are all behaving un inappropriately or, or you know a bit excited you will always have ones that will notice that the teacher stopped and the teacher is waiting so yes rose so i just wanted to add to that last point using phrases like that in a group session is also a great way to teach students um, social skills. You know, they can't yeah. just be in a social setting and talk whenever they want to. They need to realize that um, it's maybe Lucy's turn to talk, so I need to listen. Yes. So that can be a great indirect way of promoting that skill, you know, getting them used to that because I, I think it could be difficult learning a second language, especially Definitely. you don't understand the language. You don't know how it works. Mm -hmm. I, for one, if I had to learn a second language, I would find it very difficult. You know, I wouldn't know when to speak yeah. and when to listen. So yeah. that could also be a good uh, task to implement or a technique to implement, you know, getting them to realize that I need to wait my turn to talk. Great ideas. Yeah. 
perfect. And it's always ensuring that you as the teacher are in control. If you're in control of that management of that behavior, then you are preparing to succeed. And number four, quiet students. So we all have students that are very reluctant. As you said in previous webinars, it doesn't mean they don't know the answers, but they may be very shy, particularly when learning a new language. How difficult is that? You don't know how to express yourself. You feel a bit silly. Um, young children aren't, you know, they may be shy, but actually I find this happens maybe with older students because teenagers, have, they're embarrassed. It's not cool to be having this lesson. So all sorts of reasons can contribute to, contribute to why somebody is quiet. So what do we do? Embrace it. So I follow uh, something in my head called the rule of five. If I ask a question, and I have had to really teach myself to do this, I count to five, like one, two, three, like a slow five, and then I'll guide, not necessarily jump in and give the answer, maybe underline something or, or maybe ask the question again, or say even gestures, if you can see that they're thinking out about they're not sure, I sometimes I'll say, it's okay, you try, it's okay, but don't be afraid of silence, it, it, welcome it, just, just in, enjoy that, that moment. You can support and prompt uh, children students when necessary lang uh, well, sorry with the necessary language needed to answer the question so that's what we were saying before once you've given them enough time and you can see they're definitely struggling they just don't know this don't just jump in with the answer guide them to it reread the question underline keywords maybe say what do you need to look for and very often they'll get it that second or third time around don't worry if they don't get it straight away that's fine we all learn through mistakes and in group classes we would want to encourage group work so often in group classes we would pair less able students with more able students and by less able i don't mean less intelligent but maybe they've not studied english for as long or whatever it is they're learning so their knowledge isn't as great as another one and they can share and the uh the the student with with more knowledge of the subject can can give ideas but also the student with the less can give a freshness as well. And they have that sharing. And in group classes, we need to adapt, adapt activities so that all the students feel involved. So make sure you differentiate. So we give activities that involve challenging those really able, those, those very knowledgeable students, but it also challenges and involves our newer students or maybe those who are less able or dealing with some, with, some, with some issues so we constantly want to just take that time bring them out don't be afraid if they're quiet and just keep encouraging them in those different in those different ways and our fifth way so students behavior this can be quite challenging so in a physical classroom from personal experience it can be easier to control that behavior. There's different things that we can do. We could ask them to leave the room. We could ask them to go and sit somewhere else. Online, you can't do that. So what do we do if a student is behaving? No, I would never want to say naughty, but if they're behaving, they're being very disruptive, they're not listening, they're refusing to engage. Maybe they won't even turn their camera on. What the heck do we do in a situation like that? Well, here's some solutions. Some classrooms have a chat function and you can find that some very um, energetic, shall we say, and excitable students love to use the chat function, particularly in group settings, because they can send each other messages, funny messages. Well, that's distracting. And normally as a teacher, you can have the ability to turn that off. You don't necessarily have to turn it off permanently. You can always say you can, you, know, you, can, you can have that at the end of the lesson, but we're not going to use that now because we're, we need to focus and you can keep it simple. That's all you have to say, or you can just turn it off. Something as simple as that. This could be appropriate if the student is behaving in a very inappropriate manner. We would want to turn their camera or their microphone off if we feel that this is necessary. What do we mean? Well, it's quite common for children in certain countries to take you with them to the bathroom. <laughs> so nobody needs to see this. It's inappropriate. It's obviously, a, it's a, it would be a safeguarding issue. So we would have the option to turn that camera and that microphone off immediately to protect our students and to protect ourselves as well. 
but we can also do that if the student was being offensive to other students or even offensive to ourselves. Again, you're the teacher, you have that control and that's, that's appropriate. Create a reward system for your class. So very often I'll have big sticker charts. Now make sure those stickers are appropriate to the age of your students. So a nice little, little girl, princess stickers or unicorns or something like that. Well, that's probably not going to suit a young boy and it definitely won't suit a 10 or 11 year old maybe, unless you know they like those things. I like to find out what my students like. What are they interested in? Do they like cars? Do they like planes? Things like this. I know other people have like jars and they put stars and things, but something physical that they can see and that has a meaning for them. And if we do have any issues that are real problems, like that's the safeguarding that we've seen before, we want to communicate that, that behavior immediately whether that's through the company that you work with or however you would do it if you were doing freelance, if that was contacting the parents or something. That's very important that we do those, those things. Okay, so what would you do if you want to know any more information like this? Well, you can find all our content on social media and subscribing to our YouTube, you will get notified when uh, new webinars and videos are posted. So if you want to find more of our content and our videos, then please subscribe to all our YouTube and all our other social media platforms. Yeah, there's a huge amount on there. And there's being added almost daily so you can have okay. lots of things not just this short videos long videos so it'd be great if you could uh, have a look at some more so let's have a little poll now so why is it important to have a plan b for when your plan a fails when teaching online so rose over to you great okay so why is it important to have a plan b so the first option, technology is never reliable. All students have different learning needs. Teachers can't prepare in advance. Teachers don't ever need to use their plan B. And lastly, the teaching world is ever changing. And you can choose as many of those as you like. Yes. Okay, so we can see that actually everybody has chosen that technology is never reliable. Okay, which is definitely something that happens. Um, so let's have a look through now. Oh, sorry, <laughs> clicked the wrong thing. Then. <laughs> okay, so let's have a see. But having a plan B when plan A fails. So let's go to those points that we saw on the poll there. So why? Why is it important to have a backup plan when teaching online? So maybe I could open this up. What do people think is the answer to that? Why is it so important? Well, I for one know that it is a terrible feeling when your technology fails mm -hmm. or you feel unprepared. I feel like I let my students down. So yeah. I have a responsibility to make sure that, you know, all my technology is working mm. properly. Um, I have the right internet speed. Yeah. I'm prepared for my lessons because at the end of the day, they are paying for a service. As much as it's an enjoyable mm. service to provide, we are still receiving money for what we are providing. So it is very important to have a backup plan. And like we said, you know, working with technology, you, mm -hmm. you can't rely on it. Things can go wrong and they can not be your fault. Um, so you need to try and get everything in order, you know, do what you Definitely. can to make sure that you're able to present the lesson at the end of the day. Absolutely, yes. And I think it's important, again, to think how would we feel if we were the student and our teacher didn't have a backup plan? And how would we feel when we're all there really thoroughly prepared and our students' technology fails or their internet fails or so they do something so that we can't teach the lesson? It's disappointing. So how would our students feel if because we hadn't prepared, that happened to them? We'd never want to do that. We always want us, we have a responsibility as Rose said, and we never would want to let 
our students down. So having that plan B is essential. So let's look at this. This will go through the, the, um, what we had in the poll. Yes, technology is never reliable, but all of these points are also true. So the teaching world is ever changing. I've been involved in education for about 21 years now. It's a long time. <laughs> And in that time, so much has changed, not just technology, but how things are taught, the level of what children are expected to know, not just if it's ESL, but in, in, in many subjects, the reason why people learn in different ways, so much has, has, has changed and is continuing to change because mm -hmm. we are always learning. And I think um, that point is very relevant to what is happening in the world now. And education mm. is definitely moving more towards online. So that's, yes, it's changing daily. So we need to prepare for that and make sure we have things in place that can cater yeah. for that need. Definitely, definitely. And I think this is, this is personally one of my favorite points that all students are different and have different needs. So we may have taught a lesson 50 times and it's the same lesson material if you have lots of if you're very lucky to have lots of um, students well that doesn't mean we don't prepare we still have to prepare as for every student as because every student is an individual and by doing that we are prepared to adapt so if things don't work with this student we're ready we thought okay how can i extend how can i adapt how can i challenge we're ready to change Time zones and also cultural differences. So Rose, what would you have to say about these two points? So of course, we've already mentioned time zones. So it's just making sure that you, you really understand where your student is in the world so that it can the lesson can be relevant to them and you're not asking questions that are irrelevant. You know, yeah. like we said, you asking about lunchtime what are they going to eat for lunch because it might be lunchtime yeah. where you are but it's you know eight o'clock at night with your student and then cultural differences because we are teaching students all over the world it's so important to make sure that you I wouldn't say understand their culture but mm. just respect that it yeah. may be different to what you believe and what you value Yes. So for that point, I personally just try and keep it as neutral as possible. You know, I, I don't want to ask any questions that might come across as offensive or mm -hmm. something like that. You know, Definitely. the children might ask questions, but they don't understand. So mm -hmm. I would say just try and keep it as neutral as possible and don't ask you know, after certain things that they might mention, just try and move on. Um, yeah. Yeah. So just yeah. to avoid any issues with, you know, culture clashing and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so what is plan B? As we mentioned earlier, the biggest and most important thing as an online teacher is, is having a backup technology or backup power. And we've already spoken about that really, why that's so important, but it is essential. We need to adapt our lessons and content when necessary. So as we're talking about, every student's different, but you may have taught a student for a long time and you prepare for their lesson and you know, I know they know this, I know they can do this, this exercise, we've done lots of times, that's fine. But then when you come into lesson for some reason that day, they're not, they're not themselves or they find it more difficult and you haven't prepared thinking how we could adapt. So plan B would be thinking, right, okay, quick, how do I adapt? But if you prepared it before, it's already in your mind, it's already, it's already there. We use our student strengths. So when something is failing, it's not working, accept it, <laughs> own it, think this isn't working. I've done this before in lessons, tried to explain something and I can see my students and I'm not doing a very good job of it. So I will take a step back and I'll say, okay, this is, this is uh, maybe a grammar activity they're really struggling with. Right, okay, let's adapt to something else. Let's go to something that they can read really well. Let's go and do that and I'll come back to this another time. Or maybe necessary, leave it that lesson and come back to another lesson. But to do that, you need to know your student's strengths. Obviously, if you have a new student, that's impossible. So it takes time. So really get to know your students, push them, challenge them. They will surprise you with what they can do. 
we may need to change to a new teaching style or technique. We've probably all had that teacher who's been teaching for 40 years and we've all said they need to retire now. But no one needs to retire unless they want to, obviously, if they are adapting, if they are changing their teaching styles or their techniques as things modernize, as things change and all sorts of things. So we never have to get stuck in a rut. Be open to suggestions. If you are able to have an online engagement room or a staff room, share ideas. Don't be afraid to ask somebody, what have you tried this week that works really well for you? Or this is not working with this group of students. Has anybody got any ideas? Have that like humility, I suppose, to be able to say, I need some help. It's absolutely fine. The amount of things I have magpied, taken off other people and shared is, is has helped me to be the teacher that I am today. And I continue to, to do that as, as all, all of us will do. And expect students to have lessons in very unusual places. So I have taught students online in restaurants, in cinemas, in the back of a car, on a bus, at a party, um, in the park, okay, at the zoo, okay, walking home from shopping with their phone. It's, and it can be a nightmare. But if you're prepared, so even before your student comes, if, if you're prepared, okay, maybe you know, for example, it's, it's Chinese summer vacation if you're teaching Chinese students. It's very likely in normal circumstances, they wouldn't be at home. It's quite common that they may be out with their friends. So think, okay, what challenges could that, could that bring? How am I going to make sure that I still teach an effective lesson if there's lots of distractions going on and things and things like this? If you're prepared, then when they appear in their normal room, <laughs> then it's fine. But if they appear in a strange place, it doesn't bother you. Again, that comes with experience. I and mean, the first time that happened to me, I was very thrown off guard. But now you just think, okay, they might be in the back of a bus today, and that's okay. Yeah, I would Sorry, say Liz. that, no, no worries. I would say that this is probably one of the key point, uh, points in your teaching where winging it works. Yes. Um, I myself have had lessons in restaurants and mm -hmm. all sorts of places in airports. And a prime example would be they can't use the pen in the class. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you're, if your platform has that tool to use, so you need to adapt that activity. How am I going to get them to match that picture to that word, you know? So that's where you've just, like you said, it comes with experience and you get used to it. You, you start expecting these things, but don't be afraid to adapt and change, you know? If this is yeah. going to allow the student to get the most out of the lesson, mm -hmm. then by all means. And I would say don't ignore it. Mm -hmm. as well embrace it use it so they're in a restaurant oh what are you eating why are you at the restaurant who are you with what are you going what are you going to do later if they're at a party whose party is it you know get them to say well oh is your is your best friend? Oh, can you come and introduce your best friend can you describe your friend to me you can adapt and actually they, they often are very engaged because they want to show that I've been at the park with children showing me blossom <laughs> and things like this and it's great so just adapt don't worry if maybe you don't cover every single piece of your material again is your student enjoying the lesson are they learning something well then you've succeeded and then you you're, then you've, you've achieved something for your student so winging it okay so winging it in every lesson because you haven't prepared and you haven't thought about a plan B is never okay. But all teachers have to wing it at some point. So what do you think the reasons could be for this? Well, like we said, having lessons in strange places, you know, maybe it's to do with the student. Maybe you um, had a last minute booking or um, a lesson and you don't know the student very well. You know, you're going to have to feel it out. And yeah. if that's not working, well, I can't really do that. I need to change it, you know. And maybe it's from your side, you know, you're having issues with the classroom, the online classroom mm -hmm. or your internet anything like that that's just to keep the lesson going we need to constantly be adapting and changing the yeah. way we do things and 
in some circumstances, it's going to mean that everything you've prepared is just not relevant. Um, yeah. We had a question or rather a statement, perhaps you just don't know a particular question a student mm -hmm. has asked, which has happened to me personally. Yes. <laughs> That's me great. Too. <laughs> yes, that has happened to me. Yes. And there is that moment of panic. Oh my goodness, I don't know this. You couldn't possibly have possibly have prepared for it. And we've asked you this really difficult question. So you have to wing it. So when it works, as Rose said, if you're covering a lesson at the last minute, um, if you're teaching a new student, so again, you've prepared your lesson thinking, okay, let's see how and 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 they come and they're completely different and they don't they can't understand anything maybe then they're, they're not the person that you thought it was going to be sometimes you can have um somebody you might have a lesson or for for bob and and jill turns up <laughs> and it's not the student that you thought it was so again you have to wing it then and, and adapt you can only wing it like that though if you know your lesson material and you know how to adapt and there's unexpected occurrences when the planned lesson can't happen. For example, you may have a child that comes to the lesson and they're crying their eyes out. This has happened to me in the past with little, little girls or little boys. And you maybe you'll never know why. So what do you do? Do you, do you try and carry on? Well, no, because you're not going to get anywhere with them. So maybe for a few minutes, you have to wing it. I'll often get my puppets out or something and, and try and engage them in a different in a different way. I've been in lessons where a child's been perfectly happy and then they've hurt themselves. They've banged themselves on the table and they've got really upset. Acknowledge it. Don't just try and ignore it. And think, but I've got to get through my lesson material. This is when you wing it. This is when you're like, okay, this is okay to, to, to kind of pause and talk about it like this. That's that's fine. And then normally you can get back on track. But if you can't. If something something happens and you can't, don't worry, just wing it so that you can get as much of the lesson as possible with the student. But maybe maybe for some lessons you might have to say, well, I can't teach this lesson, I, I can't do that, I'll have to do something else. And it's very important to uh, expect that you will get students that just do not want to be there, but don't want to learn mm -hmm. or do the lesson and yeah. they just want to do their own thing and this is where adapting is key Definitely. if you manage to do one activity that's a win I've had a student that is just he he loves being there you mm -hmm. know he loves interacting but no go on the lesson material and I've really had to think of different ways mm -hmm. to engage him to possibly bring the topic into conversation, you know, ask, yeah. um, ask him to draw some pictures about what we're learning. So, you know, there's many different things that can go wrong in an online classroom. So the biggest advice would be to just expect those things to happen because you're yes. teaching so many different students and a new student every half an hour, hour, mm. however long your lesson yeah. may be. So you never know what's going to happen. It's true. And I found as well with ESL online, you'll often have um, a brother or sister turn up. <laughs> so, you know, Joe and then Fred turns up <laughs> who you've never met before, who is much older and the parent will expect you to teach the same lesson. So if you're fully prepared, you'll be able to do that because you'll know your material. You have to be prepared for things like that. Again, that's cultural difference, really. For them, that's that's fine. Probably maybe in other countries, you would never dream of, of doing that. So if you know those things, we can be prepared. Ooh, sorry. OK. And other reasons when it, when it works. So when students refuse to do any of the lesson material, as we spoke about, when technology has failed, so maybe your materials are no longer loaded, well, get your props out, get your flashcards out, get your whiteboard out, do it if you know the material again, although you can never be expected to remember all the activities you should have covered. You should know maybe if you were doing the past simple or toys or colours or something, you should know your topic enough to be able to do something with your student to still give them that lesson which is also the same for your materials and resources not being not available and if there is a language barrier so all of those things you can wing it and you can still be successful you have prepared 
and you will succeed. And But winging it in those situations is completely acceptable. And with experience, it becomes much easier to do as well. So sometimes, and this is a nice uh, and lovely point, that sometimes teachers are throwing curveballs and things don't always go to plan. So it's crucial that we adapt, change and reassess. And sometimes we need to wing it. It's OK to wing it in those situations. So why should teachers plan and prepare for lessons? Well, for all the reasons we've been really talking about, we want to meet our students' needs. We need to adapt. How are we going to extend? How are we going to simplify? How are we going to challenge? If we prepare, then we have a plan B. You can never prepare for every kind of situation. We understand that, that would be impossible. But if you have a backup plan, a, uh, a thing that you can go to, then you're able to, to, to adapt quickly. You want to promote flexibility during your lessons. Nobody likes a lesson that's completely stationary. You need to be able to be flexible. Again, adapting according to your students' needs and to the circumstances. And we want to help promote a professional classroom environment. If we are unprepared, students know. <laughs> they know, particularly more able students. And we are providing, as we keep saying, we are providing a service. People are paying for this. So we need to be professional and give them everything we can. By planning and preparing, it's vital. We have that responsibility. They, they want us to teach and they've chosen us online as a choice. So we need to respect that and do our bit to prepare, to prepare for it. And it also helps to facilitate learning. It encourages participation and it ensures that teachers are aware of any factors such as time zones, student behavior, cultural differences that could affect the lesson. So remember, there are some things we'd like us to remember before we leave this. At webinar. So if we want to stay calm, we need to know the procedure to follow. Remember that right at the beginning, keep calm and breathe. If we're prepared, if we know what our company policy is, if we know what our plan is, we know what the procedure is, we can be calm, take that step and say, okay, what we do in this situation is this procedure. I do this, I do that. When you're new, maybe have some notes next to you. I used to have that thinking, okay, if this happens, what do I do? Who do I contact? Have that there, it takes the panic away. Preparation obviously is paramount. This is important to ensure the correct lesson is being taught. Often online teachers, you will, you will have several teachers teaching the same student throughout the week. Now, this, this is where mistakes can happen. If you're not recording which lesson has been taught, then the next teacher, if they have a review to read, they may teach the wrong lesson. So it's important that we record what lessons being taught according to your company, but also that we're checking, is this the next lesson? What did they do last time? Yes, this is right. Oh no, hang on, something, something, something's happened here. Because it would be awful if we skipped lessons because that would produce a real gap in our students' learning. Have a backup plan as we've talk, spoken about. Keep testing your equipment. So it's great to have a backup power source but is it working? You haven't used it for 12 months because you haven't needed to because you're lucky enough to live in a country where you don't need it. Is it working? So I have never had to use mine, thankfully, but I do check it regularly to make sure it's charged and everything. And assess the situation, as we said, and just breathe. Don't panic. Take that time. If you can ask for help, ask for help as well. Don't be afraid to do that. So this is just a little section for anybody who has any questions. So no, that's fine. I think we've covered it really. We've covered it really thoroughly as well in this in this webinar today. So it's been really great to have you with us. We'll leave with end with this quote from um, H. Jackson Brown Jr. That the best sorry, the best preparation for tomorrow is doing your best today, which is absolutely true. But as we said in uh, before, if you would like to see any more of our webinars, not just on um, ESL students or becoming an online teacher, but all sorts of other content and all sorts of other topics and subjects, please click and subscribe to our channel. So we're on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Pinterest, and you will find a huge variety of things there that you can enjoy. So thank you so much for coming and for watching. And if you're watching later, that's great. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Rose. And we'll see you next week.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.